welcome back to Gorilla Presents. After a brief hiatus post-COVID, we're thrilled to relaunch with a splash featuring groundbreaking and important research from Max Morby from Thinks Insight over here. Although he might be here on your screen, I'm not entirely sure. Max has over a decade's experience spanning behavioral science within public and private sector organizations. He's worked for the world famous Behavioral Insights team, uh, Plum Fintech, Cantar Public, and is now the founder of the Behavioral Insights and Advisory at Thinks Insights. Ranging from creating behavioral objectives through behavioral mapping to exploratory, exploratory qualitative and observational research, Max is passionate about behi applied behavioral science and how it can improve our lives. In particular, he's interested in financial behaviors, sustainable decisions, and how to use behavioral insights to make design inclusive. He's also a joy to work with. So if his work excites you, I definitely recommend connecting with him on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Today's webinar is all about social media research. We know that many of you have wanted to run social media simulations. It's been possible to run simple simulations in Gorilla for a while, but now, thanks to the works that we've done in partnership with Max and his team at Thinks, it's much easier to run more realistic simulations. What we're going to cover today is a demonstration of the new social media component, a presentation from Max about the research he's done on misinformation, and a Q&A session. If you have any questions, put them in the chat or in the Q&A. I think there's a separate button for the Q&A. Yes, at the bottom, if you go along next to chat, there's a Q&A button. You can put questions there in, in there. Today's session is being recorded. That always ends up being a, uh, a question. Um, so today's session is being recorded and it will be available on our Be Online website. Uh, along with 100 plus other talks about running studies online. At Be Online, we cover online research and methodological best practices for online studies. It's really fun. So don't forget to check it out. At the end of the session, I'll be announcing our latest grants for online research. So stay tuned for that. Now, first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Johanna uh, Tomczak uh, to demo what's possible with the new social media component. Max and I are agreed that it's easier to understand his research once you understand the core interactions that his team wanted to measure. And Johanna might even let you have a play and take part in a little experiment. So with that, over to you, Johanna. Thank you very much, Jay, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you now and we can have a look at what this social media zone is about in Gorilla. Now, you should all be seeing this and we've got this nice social media post, which you can see in the middle. This was created with our social media zone, which you can see on the right hand side here. Now, let me show you a quick demo of this, of how the zone actually works. I'm going to click on play here. This is our screen demo and we can now interact with this zone. What I can do here first is react to the post by choosing one of the emoticons down here. I'm going to react with the hard one and you can now see this appears in our response processing. So Gorilla has actually received a response of that key press here. Now, if I click on repost, what I can do is repaste this post to my timeline and that also shows us the response coming up here. Finally, I can click on comment, and this means I can now write a comment in here. Um, I have seen the gorilla. Just going to type that in here, click on send, and this now posts it um, onto this social media post. Now, this was just a quick demo of what the component can do. Um, I'm just going to stop the sharing here and walk back onto the social media zone, which we can see coming up here. There are a few things, if you are familiar with Gorilla, which you will recognize, at the moment, we've got the account name. This corresponds to the name we can see up here. We've got the um, post text, which we can find um, just down here. And we've got the paste image, which is the entire image we can see on the screen. And all of those are linked currently to our spreadsheet. So they can be changed from trial to trial um, and allow us to display some kind of information which we want to have here. For example, if I now go into my spreadsheet, I can see I've got three trials. That means um, three social media posts. The account name is always going to be the same. We've got a different type of text which we're using for each of those posts. And we've got a different type of image which we've linked here which you can also see. Now, at the moment, um, our display looks more like 
Facebook, um, but it can be customized to have any interface you want it to look like. So at the moment, this component is built in script and it can be easily edited. So if I click on edit here, I can just go onto that screen again, add another object and have a look for the social media component. And I can actually see it coming up here. And to be able to add that to my task, I just click on add it um, and then I'm done. And now I've got my second zone here. I could then, for example, make those two zones appear on the screen. And I've got one social media component here, which I can configure with my responses. If I go back to the first one I had, you can see we've got a range of different settings. For example, the showing reaction, which um, relates to the reactions we can see at the bottom here. I can toggle them off. And now I only have the react, repost, and comment. I can also turn those off. And that means I only have the social post, but without any interactions that are allowed. Now, this was just a quick preview of what the zone can do and how it works in Gorilla. You can get access to the zone by just having a look on our social um, on our open materials page or um, then adding it into your task, as I've just shown you. Um, back to you, Joe. Wonderful. Thank you so much for showing everyone around that. Um, uh, did you share the link for everyone to have a play with the task if they want to into the chat? It's just in the chat at the moment. Yeah, it's in the chat. The um, the, it's the further up, um, but we ah. can send it again. Yeah, send this again. That'd be great. And if anybody wants to go through those different posts, they can. Now we're going to hand over to Max. Max, turn your video on. Excellent. So here we go. Oh, we can't hear you. Try again. Hello. Yay, there you are. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to turn my video off. And then Max, over to you to tell us what wonderful research you did with our new social media component. Brilliant. OK, so, yeah, I'm going to take you through essentially what is uh, a presentation deck that we produced uh, to publicize the research that we did. Uh, so I'll do that. And then because um, uh, I think there's some interest in talking a little bit about my career and where I've come from. So I'll talk a little bit about that with Joe afterwards. Right. So I'm not normally a Zoom user. So let's check that this works. OK. Uh, can everybody see the slides? Maybe if uh, Joe or Johanna can tell me. Yeah, we can see yeah, them. Yeah, we can. Sweet. All right. Okay. So addressing election mis and disinformation in 2024. So um, who are we? We're Thinks. Uh, so uh, we're a global insight and strategy consultancy. Uh, we're a B Corp. We tend to do social impact work. We could work across kind of four pillars, one of which is mine, which is uh, behavioral insight and advisory applying behavioral science uh, to drive positive outcomes for our clients. Um, and those clients are really diverse and actually one of the really big uh, attractions for me uh, when Vicky, who's one of the co-founders, got in touch with me, was actually this opportunity to apply and support clients, not only in the public sector, not only in the private sector. I've had kind of public sector focused and private sector focused jobs, um, but actually both of those and the third sector. And you can see some examples on the slide here. So an overview. So um, why do research on this now? Well, I'm sure you're all more than aware that 2024 is a huge year for democracy. Um, we've got uh, countries all around the world, maybe some of them more genuinely democratic, some of them less genuinely democratic, but all the same, billions of people going to the polls. Um, so it is a huge issue now. What uh, kind of election mis and disinformation uh, is spreading? And um, there's a fantastic book by Mary Beard, um, uh, who's a fantastic classicist in the UK. And she um, has this fantastic bit that has always stuck in my mind about mi election mis and disinformation in Rome, when uh, people might pay uh, people to go and write graffiti basically on the walls of ancient Rome. So like, mis and disinformation is not new. It's been with us for a very, very long time. Um, but what is new is the spread um, and quite how quickly it can do it. If you imagine having to pay someone to go walk around, you know, the Capitoline Hill uh, in Rome, writing on the, the walls nasty things about election opponents, um, as opposed to being able to distribute, distribute that on a social media platform, clearly uh, the spread is very much uh, wider. And um, 
that matters because um, actually being exposed to misinformation can increase subsequent belief. And if you fall down the rabbit hole, so you can see a picture on the right hand side there, it can be very, very difficult to get people out of that rabbit hole. And uh, for those of you who know what's going on in the picture, um, uh, it's 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 already once you've fallen down the rabbit hole, and you've marched on your uh, country's parliament or, or the capital. Um, then uh, it's it's actually a much bigger problem than we want to be treating probably with behavioral science interventions. So what we're trying to do here is think about what can stop the spread of mis and disinformation online in this really important election year. So what we did, uh, so we did an online RCT, which is a lot of what I've done in my uh, uh, behavioral science career. Um, and we also did some much more traditional uh, uh, research or much more traditional market research options, which is just like focus groups and a big nationally representative survey that we did uh, with another one of our partners. So a nice kind of mixed methods look at a number of different facets of this problem. Now, four key insights, which I'll go into. But firstly, it's a threat. Secondly, there's some really interesting exploratory stuff about deep fakes that we thought were wor was worth headlining. Um, thirdly, um, and for those of you who know the literature, and really nice to see you, Alex, um, uh, uh, on the call, uh, you'll know that inoculation games are, are um, something that particular academia has been pushing. Um, it works here, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why we went for something that could be played in such a short time, but it worked in our experiment. Um, and actually what we've been trying to do and talking to uh, uh, funders about since this uh, uh, work is actually trying to get something uh, out ahead of we're based in the UK. So the UK uh, is probably going to go to uh, uh, the polls in 2024. There's an outside chance it'll be in 2025. But we're now trying to work with people to get something like this out there um, ahead of our election. Um, we'd be delighted to talk about uh, collabing in other uh, democracies as well, of course. So um, the online RCT. So we took 1,650 regular users of social media. We basically had a question uh, uh, where we were asking them how much they uh, engage on social media. Uh, we put them through this wonderful social media simulation, which we were able to build with the help of Gorilla, um, and you can now all use. Um, and... What we did was we worked with partners to put a mix of legitimate and mis- and disinformation content into that simulation. And then we tested people's actual behavioral response in the simulation with two interventions, which I'm sure those of you who know the literature uh, will have views on uh, and maybe already be thinking what the results were, which is subject flagging and, of course, inoculation games. So I think the video which shows how we use the social media component uh, is on the right and it is playing, uh, at least on my screen. And on the left is essentially a, um, uh, 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 a diagram of what uh, we did. So you can see it's a three-armed randomized control trial. Um, we put people through the social media simulation um, and uh, the primary outcome was how they were reacting. So you've got those really nice naturalistic responses um, that people can do just as they would if they were on Facebook. And we had some post-trial survey questions as well. So the content. So we were really delighted to work with the Office for Statistics Regulation uh, and Full Fact, uh, who are two uh, pretty um, uh, 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 useful institutions in the UK. So they helped us make sure all the mis- and disinformation that we were selecting. So you can see some of it on the right-hand side here was kosher. Like it actually was mis- and disinformation that people should be worried about. But I should also highlight that um, wherever we could, particularly if it was a person, uh, we anonymized. Uh, so that's a really nice bit about the social media simulation here. Um, uh, colleagues from Ofcom who worked with me previously on experiments like this will know that we this was much harder to do. We can now change like the headings um, on here. So the election uh, disinformation that we tested was uh, a political deepfake, which I'll come back to uh, in more detail in a moment. 
Um, don't vote with a pencil. Uh, any of you who are, boast, who are based in the UK will know that there is a story going around that the awful lefties in your local council who, who do the elections in the UK um, were rubbing out right wing votes. So you have to take your, uh, uh, your pen uh, to the polling station and vote in pen as opposed to the pencil that you generally get given. Um, there was some stuff in London, particularly um, about older people who are maybe more likely to vote for the currently uh, incumbent government, uh, being able to use their Oyster card, which is what you use to travel around London as ID, whereas younger people who are less likely to vote for, for the current party in government were not able to use uh, their voter, um, uh, uh, sorry, their Oyster card. As ID, it's misinformation, um, uh, uh, but it really had a bit of an impact. And then there were two other ones um, about a dastardly Lib Dem, which is the third party in the UK, and some stuff about Muslim majorities and constituencies. So we selected these with the help of our partners um, and put them in. So the three uh, interventions. So uh, on the left, it was just a nice vanilla uh, simulation of Facebook. Uh, the one in the middle, um, any of you who've seen uh, Community Notes is a version of this uh, on uh, what I'll still call Twitter. Um, there were some efforts, um, which I know Kristen Berman's team uh, in the US um, worked on with TikTok. There are lots of different versions of this. It seems to be basically the most cheaply and easily scalable thing that platforms can do. Meta wrote quite a lot about what they did on this in uh, the pandemic. So we thought it was a good, um, uh, a good thing to test in our experiment. And then on the right hand side, uh, you saw a little video of the inoculation intervention, which for those of us uh, with knowledge of the literature know it's a really uh, good approach to, uh, uh, to trying to reduce engagement with mis and disinformation online. So you can see in R1, it's a pretty simple uh, quiz. But I think the really important thing about it is feedback and also that you can complete it really, really quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, for any of you who know Rishi Sunak, uh, this, uh, uh, this piece of uh, uh, mis and disinformation, um, uh, I thought this was quite fun. So you can see that uh, in the original, uh, uh, our prime minister has pulled a kind of OK point and there's uh, a bar lady kind of standing behind him staring into the distance. I'm not sure how maybe some of you have zoomed in, but you can see that um, on the right hand side, it's been doctored to make the PM look like he really can't pull a pint. Um, and the uh, lady working behind the bar is giving him a lot of side eye. Um, so just pointing that kind of stuff out uh, was really, really important. And if we get to the end, um, then... You can see we have a nice call to action as well, which is trying to remind people of what they learned. But it's all delivered very, very quickly. OK, so um, then um, we did uh, so focus groups uh, and national representative surveys. Uh, so I'm not going to go too much into these, but essentially we just wanted to talk to people a little bit about the results uh, in the focus groups uh, and everybody there. Uh, did the um, uh, 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 the experiment, um, although they just did uh, the uh, vanilla version, the control, uh, and we did some nationally representative surveys to get some attitudes um, at a national scale. So results. So first, um, uh, uh, I've already said this, but election uh, mis and disinformation poses a threat to the UK. So these this is some survey results that we've charted. Um, so you can see on the left, um, so people were asked to choose um, which of the following uh, options um, are currently posing the biggest threat to UK democracy. So you can see false or exaggerated information on social or mainstream media is 29% of people are picking that in their top three. Uh, does anybody want to come off mute? I'm Actually, I'm not sure, Johanna, if they can, but does anybody want to come off mute and shout at me or maybe put in the chat what they think the number one was? Because there is one to the left. That's exciting. I don't think so people everybody... can unmute, but they can no, but put in the, chat. in the chat. Yeah, everyone okay. in the chat. Yeah. What do you think the, what, how does it, high, biggest threat to democracy is, according to uh, Max's sample of 500 ish people? 2,000. 2,000 people, biggest threat to democracy. 
Drum I've roll. Seen... Drum roll. Some typing, please. <laughs> I've revealed it. It's poor quality uh, and incompetent politicians, which I think is quite interesting, right? Because people do see this as a threat. There is some uh, 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 awareness, uh, but actually uh, we have another problem, according to the general public anyway in the UK, which is the quality of our politicians. So we ask some of these uh, uh, kind of tension questions where we ask people to kind of uh, agree with statement A or statement B. So whether it's acceptable to question the uh, uh, validity of uh, results in elections or what we probably hope most people were answering, which is it's important that we respect the results. So I think what you can see here is that broadly, like the population is in a majority where you would want it to be about the democratic process. But it's really interesting, actually, the the kind of uh, uh, magnitude of the um, uh, of the population who are actually uh, questioning, see, like at least open to questioning the validity of the results of elections, and also um, thinking that maybe elections could be manipulated and or rigged in the UK. But we spoke to people about this in the focus groups because we were a little bit worried about this. And I think how I'd characterize it, and, and if you remember the piece of missile disinformation that I was talking about that we tested, which was about uh, uh, people uh, uh, in councils rubbing out right-wing votes because people who work for councils are obviously left-wing, according to this piece of missile disinformation. You can see that someone talked about it in one of our focus groups. And actually, you know, there's a healthy amount of skepticism um, so I think it's it's just actually, if you interpret these surveys results, and that's often what I really like to do with mixed methods, is actually just try and like get some quantitative data and then talk to people about it and as, go around as many times as your client uh, will let you do that. And actually, um, you know, like even people who are on what we might say is the right side of this, um, actually, in general, were also wanting to each at least say to us that they were open um so i think it's worth um uh, uh, worth pointing that out when you think about those uh, uh those survey results um we also put this up because actually we thought it was interesting that actually the reaction rate uh, so remember our primary outcome uh, it's just people reacting using those lovely little buttons we've got on the social media component not really significantly different um, uh, between the strains of mis and disinformation we worked on so the electoral one we're talking about a lot we also we were working with the office for statistics regulation so um, there are lots of national statistics stuff we put in which is in the middle and we often work with brands so we were chucking in some stuff that was relevant to various different brands on the right hand side so we think it's at least as pernicious we also have a very interesting exploratory result which we think merits much more attention uh, and i hope uh, uh, many of you will agree with us which is about deep fakes i'm just going to shut up and let you listen to this i literally told you didn't i fuck so so that is apparently Keir Starmer, who's the leader of the main opposition party in the UK, um, uh, uh, swearing at his um, uh, uh, his staffers. It's mis and disinformation. Uh, it's uh, what I call a deep fake. It's an audio deep fake, which I think people sometimes forget that you can do audio deep fakes. It doesn't just have to be images or videos. Um, and it was the most engaged with um, just on a, purely on an exploratory um, uh, uh, in our experiment. So we think it is something that it's worth paying attention to in this election year, obviously, particularly in the UK, but I'm sure it's relevant to those of you who are in other democracies as well. Um, and when we talk to people about it, again, trying to mix methods this. You know, it, it's you can just read these quotes and just, you know, it's it's a clip, it's shareable, it's a conversation starter. You can see why it spreads. And remember, that's what we're trying to treat for on our experiment. We're trying to treat for it spreading. We're not trying to pretend that with our little uh, intervention, we can change people's whole belief system about uh, mis and disinformation. But what we are hoping we can do is just reduce the likelihood that they may spread uh, mis and disinformation, which uh, is what I'll come to next. So um, I've already told you that key finding. And if we chart it, um, so basically we find uh, 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 something that 
is familiar from my research on this in the UK government. I've done different uh, uh, work with different parts of the UK government uh, previously on this uh, project. And actually what you often see, uh, certainly in the work that I've done, um, is this kind of uh, pattern where you've got the control with a higher uh, reaction rate. You've then got the flagging intervention, which remember is like a little bit like community notes is the newest one, but look at Meta and COVID-19 in the pandemic. It's like the simple scalable thing platforms do, it looks directional, um, but it has looked directional on quite a few of the experiments without reaching significance. Um, Take of that what you will, depending on how you interpret these things. Um, uh, but what we do find and what backs up the rest of the literature shows that inoculation games seem to work and our version of one um, uh, uh, did work. And for those of you who like odds ratios, um, uh, so I'm certainly not a pure analyst, but uh, wh whenever I work with analysts, they love uh, uh, an odds ratio chart. So just charting it a different way, you can see really clearly um, how much more confidence we have in uh, that reduction uh, uh, in the odds of reacting in the inoculation arm compared to the control. If you are sitting in a platform, you might want to see this chart. So uh, actually what you can see is that uh, you've got the main primary result in the blue bars. And then actually, if you chart the reaction rate to legitimate information in gold, what you can see is it's basically flat. Um, and uh, that's what you want to see, right? If you're selling eyeballs, you're selling clicks, that's really what you want to see. Um, so we were interested in that deep fake. And I, I always think it's worth looking at just like your descriptives like this um, and just going, well, look, electoral misinformation, it looks like the same pattern as the, uh, uh, as the overall. And actually the deep fake um, uh, looks pernicious, but also potentially looks treatable. Um, so we think this is a really interesting thing uh, and we'd be delighted to do more work either in collaboration uh, uh, or if uh, you can help us uh, find some funding from somewhere. I'd love to actually put this in as, as the main hypothesis into something. Finally, so, and, and this is really where I hope somebody on the call might uh, uh, have some funding or know some way to, uh, uh, to get one. We think an optimized game uh, could be really impactful ahead of the election. Um, so some of you may know this, it's from a WHO, um, uh, uh, sorry, World Health Organization um, uh, uh, publication. And that's what, what we're trying to do is just stop the spread here. And actually, you know, like if you can stop all of the things that we can measure in, in the social media uh, simulation, then um, actually you can really, really uh, achieve this objective of like stopping the spread, uh, because that's really what we think these interventions are probably good at doing. Um, we used our uh, uh, survey uh, to think about um, or to ask people to think about what they uh, would do um, between now, uh, when was it? It was January um, uh, uh, and the election. And you can see that there are two kind of pretty passive things that came out on top, which was watch a televised debate. In the UK, you often have televised debates, although it's often a question whether you actually have the party leaders, which we can go into if you want. Um, and then there are these party political broadcasts, which again is just you can kind of just sit there and take it in whether you are watching on your TV or online on your preferred uh, video uh, platform. But actually, the thing that came out top uh, uh, was actually uh, how we des described uh, what we see as the intervention that we're really excited about, which is the 45 second online quiz. Um, so if you really wanted to play it quickly, you could play it through in that time. Uh, so it was the first essentially active thing uh, that people said uh, they were open to. But, and this again is a really nice uh, addition of qual. Um, so we talked to people about it. And what I really love is that some of the blokes in the uh, focus group were saying things like, oh yeah, I'd do it. If I could show I was like better than my mates at it. Um, you know, so there are plenty of things that I'm sure we could do, and maybe you on the call are already thinking about doing, uh, that could make uh, the game that we've tested more uh, effective um, and uh, more uh, shareable uh, ahead of the UK election in our case, but obviously we'd love it if people did this overseas as well. 
And, and the other thing I'd highlight, and I think we should all be thinking about in behavioral science world, is that our little choice architecture interventions or, or inoculation games or whatever they are, are only ever one part of, um, uh, of how we drive change. And actually, you know, like backing whatever we develop in terms of the game with a meaningful kind of well-developed campaign will really, really help us achieve the outcome we want, which is to protect uh, the integrity of, uh, of democratic processes uh, in this incredibly important election year. So um, back to those key insights, and I'm delighted to discuss them with you. Election disinformation poses a threat, uh, uh, certainly in the UK. Um, we have some really interesting exploratories around deep fakes. Lots of people want to talk about those. I'd love to do some more specific research on this. I spent a lot of our marketing budget on this, uh, uh, so I don't have any money to spend, but if anybody else has, uh, I'd be delighted. Um, uh, the inoculation uh, game, uh, that we put together um, meaningfully and significantly reduced amplification of disinformation in the experiment we ran uh, uh, with the help of Gorilla. Um, and we think that optimizations um, uh, that we talked to people about in our focus groups uh, and they told us about uh, could really help us to have impact ahead of 2024 election. So yeah. That is my email address uh, and my colleague who's not currently uh, presenting with me. So if you want to get in touch, you're more than welcome uh, to be delighted to discuss this with you. Okay. Max, that was excellent. Thank you so much.